ಇದೇ ಮದುವೆ ಹಾಗೆ 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 ಹಾಗೆ
Ah, there we are. By the way, guys, the speakers, when you come up, there's a spotlight over there. It's meant to make you hot and bothered, etc. Just ignore it. So, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is almost like a gathering of old friends and acquaintances. Um, it's a nice opportunity to, to kick off the weekend, as it were, on a subject that uh, is important to everyone. What gave rise to the topic for discussion was the um, publishing and the very wide publicity that was given to the killing of those 19 children in the United States. We published a, an article or wrote an article and put out a press release that, yeah, that's sad and it's terrible. However, do you know that every 10 days we kill that number of children on our roads? What's been done about it? And please understand me, this is not a bashing government, but I think it creates a sensitivity with regard to what is happening out there and what you and I can do to make a difference. And the subject that we'll be looking at today is really about drivers who, when they get their license, believe they have the right to drive. Does that make sense? But along with that right comes a responsibility. Now, when we start looking at the subject for discussion today, we trust that it's going to sensitize audience here. And by the way, welcome to those who are attending virtually. We had 133 registrations, by the way. So it really says, speaks to something that's important to you and I. When we speak about what should be done with regard to driving, it, it raises the question of ethical behavior. You have the right to drink, provided you're not above the BAC level, you can drive, correct. You have every right to do that. But is that the responsible thing to do? And so when we look at the discussion today, we will be talking in, in different spheres. Um, one of the speakers, Dr. Lee Randall, did her thesis on the taxi industry. And it is one of the least understood forms of transport that we have available to us. Because between that and the bus industry, they transport something like 64% of our population. So, when we look at what we're going to do now, we're going to have speakers that will talk to the ethics in the taxi industry. And here's my friend, who is a very controversial character by nature, Wayne, who's from Outer. Uh, you can put up your hand, Wayne. All right, okay. uh, he, he wanted to attend virtually because he said they would be least likely to throw stones. Whether you, whether you agree with everything or not, he makes us as civil society aware of what we have as a responsibility. And then, of course, we've got over there, we've got Craig, who will unpack the anatomy of a crash. Uh, the first time I saw it, I was actually blown away. And I trust you will too. And then, of course, we, we know that at the latter part, we'll be looking at the use of EVs, the transition, progress towards zero emissions. And I have somebody from Ford here who's going to talk technology. He's promised not to sell. Could it? You're not selling Ford, eh? You're selling the technology. So, before we start with the program, what I'd like to do is just introduce our Manco team, without whom an event like this would not be possible. So please stand up. That's your invitation. The word Manco is a clue to stand up. So if you'd like to turn around, and I'm just going from the left-hand side there, we have Mo, who's our operations director. Um, please, he looks after our training facility over here, which is at NASREC. Uh, we have Nishani, who you've now probably met, virtually and otherwise. She's our sales and marketing director. We have Lauren, who's our commercial director. She's the behind-the-scenes one that, that makes us and helps us work with our virtual presentations. Derek is our training director. So if anything is below standard, you're welcome to take him to task, all right? I just work with him. And then we've got Vanessa. And I just, as a note, she's put up with me for 26 years, guys. She's worked alongside with me. <laughs> For 26 years. Just so that you know, when she had gave birth to a child, she brought it in to the office and I had to rock it while she was working. All right, there we are. It's a true story. We have Natalie, who's our financial director, and then Gino, who looks after our coastal area over there as well. So we had to look after you. If you've got any questions, please do so. You may be seated. So let's get on to our um, workshop today. And what we'll be talking to, the theme, which is driving excellence, our role as companies examining the ethics and consequences. This would not have been possible without a number of people. 
when we were asked to put this together, we prevailed upon all and sundry. And I promise you, this is a large vote of thanks to the interest that they have in a non-political, non-partisan activity that makes a difference to people's lives. And so therefore, when we look at the discussion today, please see it in the light that we can make a difference. And as with our Fleet Safety Awards, it was our opinion that in the absence of it, something being done by government, corporates would step up and recognize those individuals who play a critical role and indeed their organizations. So with that thought in mind, we're going to kick off our presentation and we're gonna ask Craig, who's our first speaker. Craig, just so that you know, his bio has been on there. Um, he's been in the field of uh, traffic investigation, reconstruction and cause analysis since 1991. You've seen his bio and I think you should be impressed, but let's listen to what he has to say. Craig, please. Morning, everybody. Okay, first of all, if I, my voice is a bit shaky, it's not because I'm nervous. Thank you for the cold. I'm from Durban. <laughs> we never have cold like this. When it's cold, it's 15, 16, and then I'm shivering already. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, ironically, um, the figures that Eugene was talking about, if you aren't aware, I'm going to tell you now, there's a big crash outside Pretoria this morning now. There's a bus crash. Uh, the insurers have just phoned me and appointed me and asked me to go there now. So I nearly ran off, but uh, I'll go quickly afterwards. There's already 15 dead. So Eugene, your figures in one day are already blown out the park. Okay. Um, thank you, Eugene, for the invite. Thank you to Master Drive. You guys are exceptional. You always do a very good job. And thank you to all the partners that are involved here. Um, it's an exceptional thing to come and uh, speak to everybody i think for most of you that are here you all role players in this industry in some way so we're speaking to the converted but for those that are attending online uh, it, what i'm going to show you is an interesting perspective i'll take 15 minutes of your time quickly when eugene asked me to look at this i thought to myself this particular case is a brilliant case study the, the issue of ethics personally and as a company come through hugely in here the issue of modern technology responsibility come through hugely on this. We have many cases like this that we can show you, but we just thought this was a very good case. So the anatomy of crash. <clears throat> I'll figure it out eventually. All right, so the very basic parameters. So first of all, the acknowledgement, Poppy Act uh, acknowledged. So for those of you that have any issue with me showing you what you're going to see, the family have agreed to this very kindly. I worked very closely with them, the attorneys, and this case has just been finalized literally two days ago in court. Okay, moving on, next slide, please. All right, so the basic parameters are, this is a double fatal crash, two people killed. It happened on the 6th of February, 2021. Uh, it is on the N3 eastbound, in other words, traveling towards Durban in the uh, Howick area, and it occurred essentially directly opposite the Midmar Dam, uh, dam wall. Three vehicles involved, a little Opel Corsa light hatchback, the old little bubble vehicle, and uh, a Toyota Hilux uh, Bucky as we know it, and a man, horse, and trailer combination. All right, so the very basics of it, it's a young lady had a mechanical issue with her Opel Corsa, the car had broken down, the young lady had managed to pull off the road into the yellow demarcated emergency lane line. Now just keep this in mind because this could happen to any one of you. Contact was made with her mother and her father. Uh, the father drove through to go and find his daughter to assist her. The father stopped his Hilux a short distance behind his daughter's Opel Corsa in the emergency lane, as you'll see. It appeared from the outset at face value when we were instructed on the case that the man truck had collided into the back of the Toyota and subsequently a knock on effect. Right, so what you are seeing there is basically the scene itself. Sorry, it is now working. So you can see the Midmar Dam at the bottom. This is the N3 stretch of road. I'm sure at some stage all of you have driven this. Uh, 
I may just point out at the moment that the N3 at the moment, and no disrespect to anybody, is a particularly dangerous place going on with all the constructions going on at the moment. So please just be very aware. All right. So just a bit of a close-up view. The, the Midmar Dam wall is on the bottom, and that is exactly where the scene occurred. So there for you is the three vehicles involved. Top left is the particular uh, horse. Uh, the middle two photographs are the Opal Corsa of the young lady that stopped initially with a mechanical problem. And the father's vehicle is the vehicle on the right hand side. All right, so what you're seeing here is a very, very brief synopsis of a 180 page long report in extreme detail. So the top left is one of the quick glimpse photographs for you. That is one of the original photographs taken on the scene showing where the Toyota Hilux came to rest on its side against the barrier. The top right is where the Opal Corsa came to rest on the scene. And in the bottom photograph, you can see very basic synopsis, a drawing we've done showing basically where all the evidence is that we found. So we go through this process of analysis. So for your convenience, that's some of the actual photographs taken uh, on the same day as the crash uh, and also the day after. You can see there's various evidential factors, scrub marks, yaw marks, soak patches, positions of the vehicles. We use these to do certain analysis. Uh, an interesting fact you can see from this photograph as well as the aerial photographs is that it's a dead straight road. You're going to see this as an eye opener very shortly in the actual in-vehicle camera footage. So we go through a process of proper forensics analysis where everything is photographed in detail, everything is measured, and all the measurements and comparative photographs are put in. So that headlight hit that round spot, therefore we can position the vehicles. The top left, you can see the angular uh, symmetrical pattern, that fits with the angular symmetrical pattern of the bull bar. So we can, as matter of fact, in court, not by balance of probabilities we can tell you as a matter of fact we measured those we positioned everything together so this is the process that you go through the bottom photograph in the middle uh, you will see that photograph again just now it is a fairly gruesome photograph but in fact that photograph allows us to determine on its own exactly where one of the uh, the drivers was standing outside of the vehicle because of the human tissue transfer on the vehicle at that point Okay, again, uh, that is the same diagram as the previous one, but through various factors we could determine independently, at this stage we didn't have the video footage because it had been arranged by the police and we were going through the process of looking at the physical evidence. We were able very clearly to match where the vehicles ended up, how they contact each other, and reversed from that, from the physical evidence on the scene where the crash occurred. So on the top photograph uh, diagram, you can see that's the exact overlap measured quite accurately. Uh, that is the first contact with the Toyota uh, positioned behind the Opal Corsa. Uh, there was a secondary impact after the truck initially struck the Toyota. It pushed the Toyota forward and out of the way. As the truck continues along, it then uh, hits into the Opal Corsa again. So you may recall back at the Im images, there was also quite severe damage to the front of the Opal Corsa. That was because it spun around it was then hit a second time and pushed across the road. So one of the factors we looked at, we looked at whether the headlights were on on the uh, Toyota Hilux, we looked at whether the lights were on, uh, headlights and taillights on the Toyota, the Opal, as well as the truck. Uh, there's various processes you go through, but uh, at the end of the day, we were able to determine, as a matter of fact, most definitely lights were on, and this was later on uh, subsequently proven. So there's that photograph again. Uh, one of the questions was, where were the, so to say, pedestrians or the two drivers, where were they standing on the scene? We were able to determine at this stage on a very strong balance of probabilities, they were standing at the back of the Opal Corsa and outside of their vehicles and the two of them were likely together. We could tell this from where they ended up, the nature of the injuries, the transfer, various factors. And again, see in the video footage and subsequently this was proven. Okay, so you can see on the diagram, we indicate where they were standing, the little red circle. In this particular case, uh, the transporter cooperated with us, and uh, uh, this is that moral and ethical issue that Eugene is talking about. 
does the transporter need to cooperate with his insurer? Does the transporter need to cooperate with the police in their investigation? Should he? What is the legal ramification back to him? Uh, so in this particular case, as you can see, this vehicle was fitted with telemetry, both independent tracking as well as in-vehicle video footage, which you're going to have the privilege of seeing. So one of the factors we have to look at, we don't just accept it at face value. We go and look where was the camera, what was its view, what camera was used, what were the frames per second, uh, is it valid, how do we know it's from this vehicle, all of these factors we go through. Okay. So here for you is the actual video footage. I'll warn you up front, there's nothing green that you're going to see, but it is the actual crash. Uh, for your convenience, I would pay attention to the top left, the two images on the top left, if you can play that for me kindly, sir. So just to guide you along, the top left is the actual video footage of the vehicle. You can see it's traveling along the N3, approaching the scene of crash. The image next to that is the driver. And on the bottom right-hand side, you can see the vehicle speed, fairly consistent, 60 kilometers an hour. So in reality, you would need to look at this a couple of times. We run this through a bit of software and we extrapolate each individual image and that's put into the report and we analyze it from that but you can get a feel on the top left you can see the tail lights already of the stationary vehicles on the left you can see the driver is fairly nonchalant about things you can see the hazards flashing you notice the yellow line look at the position of the truck drifting into the yellow line It's quite an eye-opening clip to see, and I can tell you, in the last three years, and Kathy, I think you are at pretty much the forefront of also driving this issue, the issue of telemetry first came around with tracking, but now video footage linked with that. We are literally daily getting these clips to analyze, because it's not just the crash. They want to know why, how, etc. you know. Okay, next slide, please, sir. All right, so going to the scene, obviously, this is one of the images we extrapolate. Unfortunately, at the moment, one of the issues with uh, the video RVM in vehicle monitoring is that they're not usually high resolution images. So you can get a feel for what's happening. But interestingly, you may remember I said to you we were able to show where they were standing. In fact, you can see, if you look at this, the frame before and the frame after. But we can see the Bucky, we can see the Corsa, we can see the two people standing. In between the two vehicles okay we can see he was doing about 68 kilometers per hour we can look at all of those issues so we were able to confirm independently and then we were able to look at this and confirm it even further all right so just some quick questions we nearly finished a slide or two so this comes back to the issue that eugene raised the, this moral and ethical issue so now we have this analysis that's done independently we have this analysis that's done from this in vehicle video footage and now these questions arise what is the driver's experience what is his history we have the question of what is the trip the trip origin what's the distance what's the driving hours so we have to ask the company these kinds of things where did he stop did he sleep did he sleep properly or did he not sleep is he stressed does he have a home life um, pre on duty what did he do the day before the hours before he came on duty uh, alcohol drugs what's the policy within the company uh, do they have a policy is there a standard operating procedure sops as you'll know in terms of do they test the drivers when they come on what is their policy do they have a written policy regarding alcohol drugs these moral and ethical issues Fatigue, how do they deal with fatigue? Is there a fatigue policy? How do they monitor their drivers? We can see they have this beautiful telemetry as a lot of these transporters do, but it's not used, it's not, it's not monitored. Medical issues, does he suffer from diabetes? Does he 
you know, have heart problems, all these other factors. So these are all these moral and ethical questions. So the company procedure, policy, proactive monitoring, and tracking and driver performance. This comes back to what Eugene and Master Drive teach people. It's not just about driving your car, it's the whole psyche, as uh, Lee will also talk to just now as well. It's, it, it, there's a lot more to it than just this analysis. So most importantly, what is the company's procedures, their policies, their operating procedures, their records on this issue? This all comes back to this moral and ethical standing. How do they run the company? How do they monitor this? So interestingly, I'll put this in because you'll get the presentation for yourself. Once you start looking at this whole issue of looking at this in-vehicle footage, and not only that, even the actual tracking reports, you have to start understanding human psyche a little bit about, and I'm not a psychologist, but <laughs> or, or, or that kind of uh, studied field, but you have to at least understand this body language. If someone's driving and they're blinking slowly, if they're lethargic. So there's a lot of things you have to look at, and, and there's some interesting references here. If you have an interest and you run fleets or you're responsible in that way, you can read through some of those references for you. Okay, so the basic findings were, I'm not going to read through all of those. I think you can pretty much see for yourself. The driver was negligent here, okay? And we're going to come to that point now in the last two slides. This is verbatim a quote from two days ago from the statement handed in by the driver in court. He's been to court twice, he pleaded guilty, and I will read it out for you just for sake. I was driving on the N3, which is a national freeway coming from Middleburg, Mpumalanga province, heading to Durban. Whilst I was busy driving on the said road, I happened to lose concentration as I was exhausted. That is perhaps the most key factor in the whole statement. Since I had been driving for the whole day and as a result, I lost concentration. Consequently, thereby causing the motor vehicle I was driving to move to the left and across over the yellow painted line where I collided into two stationary motor vehicles, two drivers who were standing in between the two stationary vehicles. I wish to state that I noticed before the collision that the two motor vehicles were stationary on those yellow painted lines, their hazard warning lights were flashing and people were standing in between the vehicles. Now, that there in itself is a synopsis in closing of this entire analysis of this crash. It is a synopsis of the whole modus operandi or, or subject matter that is brought up here. It is not just about the crash or physically what happened. The biggest question that raises here for me is what is the moral and ethical standing of this company, this transporter, to have monitored this driver, that the driver has fatally killed your husband and your daughter, and he was tired on the road, and he is now found guilty. But where is the monitoring from that transport company, seeing as they had all this telemetry and all this access to this information? So this links directly with everything. So that's my synopsis of everything for you. I hope it's a bit of an interesting overview. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Craig, thank you very much. You know, the challenge in getting rather profound speakers is that they get called off at a moment's notice to go and attend to their main business. So in advance, just say thank you to Craig. If there's any questions that you'd like to feel, because I appreciate that you need to get going, you're welcome to share them with us and we will get them through to Craig and I promise you he will respond. But it speaks to, as, as um, Craig indicated, the morality of the way we enforce policies. And we'll touch on that later. We'd now like to introduce Lee Randall, Dr. Lee Randall. She at the moment is an occupational therapist and is a bioethicist and is currently doing her postdoctoral research um, she co-founded a project called the Road Ethics Project. It's, and I'm going to read this to you, aimed at fostering ethical literacy amongst road users and promoting Vision Zero and the safe system road safety model. That safe system, by the way, if anybody knows about it, it's an international standard. And by the way, I must punt for Master Drive, that is incorporated in our training program. Hello, Peggy, I see you at the back there. I'm now going to hand over to Lee, please. And I appreciate, and she also stands on the probability she's going to be called to court as an expert witness. So, Lee, over to you. Hi, can everyone hear me? 
Yes. Great, thank you so much. Yes, there is a road accident fund matter in which I'm an expert witness, so I may well be called to court, so I may miss the second half of today's session. But thank you very much. I'm delighted and honored to be part of the speaker lineup, and I can't think of a better lead in to my particular talk than what Craig has just given on the anatomy of a crash. I've called my talk Crashology and the Ethics of Road Use, and I'm hoping to just share some insights from my clinical work and my research. So as Eugene mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist by background, and after 30 plus years of working with clients, many of whom were crash survivors, including road accident fund claimants, I went and knocked on the door of the Steve Biko Center for Bioethics at WITS and I enrolled for a PhD. And I embarked on a driver-centric study exploring the bioethics of road safety within the Johannesburg minibus taxi industry. You've heard um, some further developments from Eugene and I'm going to come back to those later on. My current postdoctoral research focuses on travel behavior, road safety, road ethics, and a number of other topics, all in the public health field. So let me just go back to the origins of the field of bioethics or ethics. And really it began with the ancient Greek philosophers whose main question was, how should we live? Or how should we live together? And the answer to that question really rests on number one, individual ethics principles which guide our behavior in real life situations, how we decide what is right or wrong for us. But broadly, we also are subject to societal ethics or mores, which are broadly agreed principles as to what is right or good for members of a particular society. And then of course, there's the field of ethics as an academic or uh, as a field of study, which involves generating knowledge about concepts of right and wrong, systematizing that knowledge and developing arguments or hypotheses. So as a road ethicist in particular, one is asking how should we use the road traffic system together? And what I've shown on this slide is just the sheer diversity of road types, vehicle types, and human user types. And of course, this is not exhaustive. There could be many other types of roads, vehicles, and users that we could think of. Now, it's a growing global concern that the road traffic systems that we've developed over the last 120 years, 130 years or so, are now presenting us with numerous ethical crises. And one of the most pressing crises is around climate change and what vehicles and vehicle emissions are doing to our climate. Another crisis is what roads and road networks and vehicles do to the natural environment, fauna and flora. Road crashes are of course an ethical crisis in and of themselves and they cause immense loss of life and also life-changing injuries. And unlike Craig, who's really at the gruesome end of, of crash scenes, I see the survivors months, weeks, sometimes even years after the crash that they have survived mm -hmm. and the life-changing impact of that crash on themselves, yeah. colleagues, family, friends is really, really striking. But another aspect of the road traffic system that we've come to accept almost as if it's part of the natural order is things like congestion, traffic jams, pollution, and also more and more sedentary ways of traveling, which feeds into the fact that obesity and non-communicable diseases have become a global epidemic. So given all these ethical crises and given my curiosity about understanding more as to how and why crash happen, crashes happen, how to make them less serious and also how to stop them, I embarked on my research and you might ask, but why did I focus on the Joburg minibus taxi driver? Well, I assessed a minibus taxi driver as part of his road accident fund claim in about 2010. And he had lost his entire right arm due to a traumatic amputation 
when his minibus was hit by a private driver who shot through a stop street, hit him from the left side and caused his vehicle to capsize. He'd been driving with his entire arm hanging out of the window because it was an extremely hot day. The taxi had no air con. And I'm sure we've all seen how the drivers do this just to cool themselves down. His life story was really poignant and he made it clear he never set out to be a taxi driver. He was college educated, but could not find a suitable job. And so he was a taxi driver as a stopgap measure. And here he was with his life absolutely shattered by this particular crash and the consequences for him. But I was also drawn to researching with taxi drivers because it was really clear that the public tend to blame them quite disproportionately potentially for crashes. And there's a huge amount of moral outrage that gets expressed, whether it's on talk shows or in the press about taxi drivers and how they drive. The other rationale for doing this particular piece of research was the very important role that minibus taxis play in South Africa. They carry 65 to 70% of commuters and in fact, even more, potentially up to 80% of commuters in a city like Joburg are commuting by a minibus taxi. They are affordable, especially to poorer people, relatively affordable. And that of course is why a national shutdown has been mooted for today because the fuel price and the resultant need for taxi fares to go up is challenging that affordability. They have been shown to reduce commuting time. They are highly flexible and they're extremely passenger responsive. But as well as all of that, the minibus taxi industry is an employer of thousands and thousands of people, in particular drivers. Furthermore, when minibus taxi crashes happen in a city such as Johannesburg, they have a big multiplier effect and the bus crash happening outside of Pretoria this morning and other crashes that have happened in the very recent past involving mass passenger transport, buses and minibuses, show us what a serious multiplier effect one vehicle being involved in a crash can have when it has multiple occupants. In the case of minibuses, they're also highly injurious vehicles Think about it, they tip over very easily, they capsize, they overturn, and many, many of them have no seat belts for their passengers in the back, and they may not even have working seat belts or airbags and other safety features, even for the driver and the front passenger. In addition, they are what is called a bad crash partner, but they're higher, heavier, um, and significant damage can be inflicted on a crash partner such as a pedestrian or a smaller vehicle when a taxi collides with that crash partner. So all in all, it's not surprising that you in Habitat many years ago said that improving the safety of minibus taxis is critical to reducing deaths and injuries from road accidents in the developing world. So what I'm going to do is take you really briefly through certain aspects of my research findings. And I'd like to mention that it was mixed methods research. Number one, I did quantitative research where I looked at, uh, I did a survey of 50 drivers at 20 ranks in Greater Johannesburg to find out more about their work conditions, their levels of concern about crashes and their views of what are the crash causation factors within the industry. Then I did a qualitative part to my study where I did in-depth interviews with a smaller subset of drivers, doing those telephonically with the help of an interpreter during the lull period in the day between the morning peak and the afternoon peak hour. From those, I drew themes and I'm going to quickly run through the seven themes that came from the interviews and I'll touch briefly also on some of the quantitative findings. Ultimately, though, my, my research imposed a normative frame. In other words, it compared what I'd found on the ground and what our literature says with global best practice. And I drew some normative or moral or ethical conclusions about the situation. So let's 
go through some themes quickly. And I'm sure most of them are not going to be surprising to you because I think most South Africans are pretty familiar with the industry, whether as users or whether simply as other people who use the roads that are used by taxis. Theme one was the biggest theme. And it was, it's all about the money. Yes. Okay, I think somebody's mic is not muted. Let me keep going. Um, the drivers, both in the survey and in the interviews, talked about the fact that they feel that they're chasing money from morning till night, or as one person said, from dark till dark. The money they're requiring, and that comes purely from passenger fares, which are relatively low fares, is to pay the owner of the vehicle a due at the end of the day. And that due varies depending on the route, depending on the size of the vehicle, and depending on the agreement between the driver and the owner. But the money that comes in also has to cover fuel, taxi washing, sometimes minor repairs like uh, windscreen wipers, um, the driver's license fees, and you'll have a chuckle about this also, fines and bribes. And it's the leftovers that become the taxi driver's earnings. Although what I did find in my survey was that some of them also report receiving wages from the taxi owner once a week and sometimes as little as 200 rands for the week. <laughs> um, the other aspect of the cash and money theme was around cash handling and the fact that while driving, the driver is also having to physically handle cash and mentally handle some cash calculations. Theme two was another striking theme, and it was really about the drivers feeling that their job is not proper. It's not respected the way, say, a bus driver's job is respected. And it's also not proper in the sense that they don't tend to have employment contracts, they don't tend to receive pay slips, and they don't tend to have confined and agreed upon work hours. The survey revealed that on average, the drivers were driving 14.6 hours a day. The sectoral determination for the taxi sector says that they should only be driving nine hours a day, and they're also required to have rest days in their week. The drivers in my study reported, 100% uh, of them reported that they were six days a week, and more than 80% reported working seven days a week. And they tied this kind of issue in their work conditions to the fact that it's not really a proper driving job. Theme three, again, I'm sure you'll have a chuckle, but I used phrases from the interviews to name the themes. So this was a phrase presented by one of the taxi drivers himself. And he said, taxi drivers drive like delinquents. And really that echoed a lot of what other drivers said, both in the survey and in the interviews where they acknowledged bad driving, lawless driving, um, delinquent driving. But there were two elements to this theme. One was the acknowledgement of lawlessness um, that went in many drivers' views with the culture in the industry, but also what is required of them to meet the obligations of the job. The other aspect of this theme was around self-fulfilling prophecies. If society views us as delinquents and traffic cops blame us for everything that happens on the roads, then we're going to live up to that, was sort of the message that came through in the survey and the interviews. Theme four, another very strong theme, foreshadowed in the surveys where the majority of drivers reported that the vehicle they drove was more than seven years old and a good quarter reported that the vehicles were more than 11 years old. Now, this is very scary, given that the Department of Transport sees the reasonable operating lifespan of a minibus taxi as seven years. But besides the age, both the interviews and the survey results pointed to many, many vehicle defects, from faulty brakes and tires um, to cracked windscreens or missing windscreens, 
steering problems, electrical faults, doors that didn't close properly, and then a lack of basic safety features in all but the very newest vehicles. So safety features such as airbags tended to be absent and safety features such as seat belts throughout the vehicle were absent in the vast majority of cases. Theme four, one of the drivers I interviewed used the, the phrase, we are not transporting Coca-Colas. And this tied in very well with a lot of the other information which came forward, which suggested that the drivers are somewhat stressed by the responsibilities, the ethical responsibilities that come with the role they play. One driver pointed out that there could be an entire family traveling in his vehicle. Um, other drivers pointed out the responsibilities of getting people to work safely, getting people home safely, getting school kids to school safely. But the other element of this theme was that their, let's call it human cargo, interact with them. It's not like transporting Coca-Colas. The, the human passengers speak up. They sometimes exhort the drivers, go faster, you're going to make me late for work, Get, go into the yellow lane, jump this robot. And they then take the drivers to task if they get stopped in a roadblock um, or called over by the police. Now, the photograph that you see me using to illustrate this theme hopefully is very unfamiliar to you. It was taken in Harare when I went there to assess an injured client. And we don't tend to have this in South Africa, fortunately. But in many parts of Africa, it's not just the legitimate passengers within the vehicle that the driver is having to deal with, but also potentially illegitimate extra passengers who are riding for free and who add to the burden and the road safety risks that the taxi driver is facing. Oh, I'm sorry, I had not moved the slide on. Now you're seeing the picture taken in Harare a couple of years back, um, showing one of the realities which we fortunately don't have much of here, if at all. Then theme six, during the period of my research, there was a taxi blockade and uh, there was some discussion around this during the interviews, and I'm using the terms given by a couple of the different drivers in the interviews. We push the economy. We should own the road. And this was very much in response to the public saying, hmm, they drive like they own the road. And the kinds of things that came up in this theme were that, for instance, the Rea Via has dedicated lanes and all the various formal bus services in Joburg, they have dedicated stopping places that have been designed with safety in mind according to the needs of those services. Whereas minibus taxis, which transport by far the greatest proportion of commuters, have a system that is not designed for their needs. And that does result in the phenomenon of I stop anywhere, anytime. And that phenomenon is also now expected by the passengers. And then finally, theme seven was another very strong theme where the drivers expressed a concern that the industry is pretty neglected by government. And in particular, the safety of drivers and passengers is not taken seriously by government. And two government departments came up time and again. One was the Department of Labor, as it was called back then. And the issue was a lack of enforcement, a lack of inspection, a lack of safeguarding of the drivers and also their lack of access to safety nets like UIF, workers' compensation and paid sick leave. The other government department that came up time and time again was the Department of Transport, which is the custodian of the road traffic system, should be overseeing safety of all vehicles, safety of all road users and appropriate design of all roads. So out of the overall findings from my research, including looking at them through an ethical lens, I drew the conclusion that Joburg minibus taxi drivers and the way they drive are really an indicator species. In other words, they're something that indicates the state or level of something else, something bigger than themselves, like the canary in the coal mine. And what they indicate is that our road traffic system is and I coined the term crashogenic. 
In other words, we have physical, legal, sociocultural, political, and economic factors, which together create a high likelihood of road crashes and resulting deaths, injuries, and disabilities. If you look at the safe system model of road safety, we have multiple failure points in our system. And so instead of safe mobility being the output of the system, we have an unusually high level of crashes and also many very serious crashes in our scenario. So I've come to favor the term crash over the term accident, even though for the purposes of my research and my thesis, I did not ban the word accident. The term taxi accident rolls off South African tongues very easily. And it was used by my interviewees and by key informants and so I could not simply ban the term accident, which also appears in our legislation, like the road accident fund related legislation. However, a, the word crash says it like it is. And I think Craig's talk really illustrated this. It's a violent collision between two or more objects. And it's often predictable. It's often preventable if not always predictable and preventable. Whereas the connotation of the word accident is that it's something that happens by chance with no apparent or deliberate cause. And therefore there's a sense of helplessness or fatalism that we cannot interrupt the, the chain of events that leads to it happening. So coming back to the pointing hand, pointing at taxi drivers that triggered my research in the first place. By the end of it all, I was very conscious that the pointing hand points straight back at us. And we, as part of the road using community in which minibus taxis are a very dominant feature, we need to have a bit more insight into how the industry operates and how important it is, and also how risky it is in its current form. So please, next time you see a minibus taxi driver, whether in Joburg or anywhere else, please do look a little differently at the driver with a bit more insight, a bit more empathy, and possibly more concern about what we can do differently, given that so many South Africans are reliant on this industry. Now, I'm not a believer in research staying in the ivory tower. I really believe that when research is done, the findings need to make it into the public domain. And as a result, as Eugene said earlier, I was part of co-founding the Road Ethics Project, a nonprofit company, together in fact with Eugene, who was instrumental in, in um, shaping the way I approached my research. And our third co-founder and director was Tami Khadebe, the late Tami Khadebe, who was the field worker interpreter during my research. And very unexpectedly and unfortunately, he passed away last year. So we have two new directors within the project. Our purpose is to engage people around ethical road use. We want to spark conversations. We want to change minds. We want to shift behavior. And we want to do all of this with the express aim of helping to save lives and reduce injuries on our roads. And I've put the logo of the SADC Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety on the bottom right of the slide, just to show that we're not only focused on South Africa, we're very keen to have an impact on the region and also on the continent. So on the last slide, you will see my two email addresses, um, the Road Ethics Project Africa one being connected to the nonprofit company, but also my VITS email address where I wear an ongoing hat as a road safety related researcher. Now the Road Ethics Project is looking for collaborators, like-minded organizations. We have some exciting activities coming up this year and beyond. So please do get in touch. If you see a way that you could collaborate donate or become a customer um, and engage with us around our training products and our paradigm shifting workshops and talks. So thank you very much for your time. It's been a privilege and I wish you all of the best for the rest of the workshop and the rest of the day.
back of a bucky, for example. So please, when you get that invitation, you're more than welcome to attend. Uh, just before I introduce our next speaker, there's some lucky dip prizes. So you don't stay until the end of the, the, the debate or the panel discussion. You don't qualify, all right? So please do stay. And yes, for those who are virtual, there will be something for you, but you're going to have to work damn hard for it. So our next speaker, Wayne Divinage, as you know, he's the CEO of Outer. I would just like to give you what his favorite quote is. And this is from Tyree Scott, who said, you can't leave people who created the problem in charge of the solution. And that, of course, led to his founding of the uh, uh, civil activist group, Outa. But let me not steal his thunder. We'll invite Wayne to the platform. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks very much, Eugene. And um, to the organizers uh, uh, for inviting me to be here today uh, and to talk on the topic of accountability uh, for road safety uh, and I don't want to be controversial and I hope you don't think I'm being controversial but um, I'm going to say it as it is look our belief or view is that the accountability of road safety ultimately rests with the state um, uh, of course after that it becomes individuals and businesses role and responsibilities to do so much that is required of them and I think following on what Lee was just saying, we can talk a bit about the ethics and, uh, and the general societal and individual ethics approach to living, really. Uh, and I can assure you, and I think you know that people don't want to drive unsafely. People don't want to put their lives at risk. Um, and so the general norm for individuals is to tend towards and move towards uh, a state of organized uh, uh, driving, organized um, rules and regulations, uh, but they can't do that in the absence of the role that the state has to play. So um, in saying this, I don't, I don't want us to negate or set aside the, the, the responsibility of the individuals, um, but there's another factor that comes into this whole space, and we'll, I'll get onto that now, which is the role of active citizenry, or more so active corporate citizenry, uh, when it comes down to what the role of the state is. So the entire na national culture of, of individuals and business conduct and behavior when it comes to driving and walking on our, our roads or using our roads is a reflection on how the state plays its role, and specifically in, in these three areas road quality, policy and regulations, and enforcement. And I'll just start with the area of road quality. If a nation's roads are well constructed, they're well maintained, well designed, well signposted, there are bridges, there's drainage, pedestrian facilities, the country goes a long way towards road safety and the efficient flow of transport. But when there's one or a number of those areas that are missing, then road safety deteriorates. Road injuries and fatalities begin to increase. And I don't have to tell you how our country fares when it comes down to our road quality. Um, the Department of Transport and various MECs in and, and, and the provinces have let us down, largely, and in our municipalities. Just over a year ago, a report uh, by consulting firm uh, uh, Frost and Sullivan stated that 30% of South Africa's paved roads are in a poor to very poor condition, and that 45% of the country's unpaved roads are also poor to very poor. And a year later, that is much worse. On a national road perspective, Senral does a good job. They're told, they've got a lot of uh, funds, they've got engineers, they take their job seriously. Uh, and their roads are pretty well maintained. But that's, that's about 22,000 kilometers of the 750,000. And it's in that other 700,000 kilometers of provincial and regional and municipal roads where our problem lies. And, and we've got to ask this question, why is that? I mean, of course, rains, uh, heavy rains and uh, pandemics that slow down maintenance and building exacerbate the problem. Uh, but our problems are not related to that specifically. Our problem really comes down to four 
main issues when it comes to road quality. The first one is a lack of strong uh, and meaningful oversight by government in the spending of funds that are allocated to road infrastructure. The money is there, but when funds are allocated to provinces, it doesn't find its way uh, for roads in provinces, it doesn't find its way onto those roads. Money is not being spent where it should be. It is uh, siphoned off into other areas. And the problem with maintenance, and maintenance I'm talking in general in a mindset of government, is that it can happen tomorrow. We'll put that off till next year because the road is still okay for now. But when you pass a certain threshold of road deterioration, uh, you reach a state of road shedding, you have to literally rebuild those roads. And that becomes an even bigger problem. So if we're not going to spend the money that is allocated to roads, what are we going to do? We have to start holding government to account. And that's the role of civil society. Then I get to the um, issue of lack of oversight on the quantity and quality of those roads. So when money is allocated to maintaining and fixing or building roads, the shocking quality that is allowed to take place uh, where these roads a few years later um, don't exist anymore. They become potholed. The quality of the uh, workers uh, is shocking and uh, there's no oversight. Nobody is following up on the companies that were allocated the funds to build these roads. No one's holding them to account. Very often the companies have gone into liquidation, but their directors form new companies. They tender for the next road project. They get the next road project. And we have the same problem repeating itself. And then, so the quality is bad and the cost of those roads. The South Africa is spending, in many cases, three times the price it should be paying for roads. So we can get three kilometers extra for every kilometer that we're paying for. And that, again, is a lack of oversight. Now, why, why is that allowed to happen? Even here in, in GFIP, we paid 18 billion rand for a 186-kilometer upgrade, not new road, upgrade, resurfacing with a few extra interchanges that are widened and so forth. That's a serious indictment when that road should not have cost more than 9 billion rand, at most, and probably could have been a lot less if we look at the figures and the quotes that Sanral was giving, giving us. And these are big construction companies that were found wanting in collusion. But what happens? Nothing. Not one director charged and arrested, not one MEC loses their jobs, not one company, and if there are, we'd like to know about them, is ever held accountable. Roads are paid for before they even start to be built and then and the, uh, contractors disappear with the money. But everybody keeps their jobs, and the quality continues to deteriorate. So we've got the money. And that's where we come down to this third aspect of, 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 um, of this matter. This is accountability and lack of consequences. Nothing is happening in that space. But it's in this fourth area of active citizenry where I'd like to just elaborate a little bit on. We are too weak as business as individuals and largely corporate uh, organizations and associations when it comes to holding government to account. We moan, we say the roads are bad, everything is wrong, but nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody is shaking government's tree. We have big organizations. They say Roads Federation, the Road Freight Association, BUSA, the National Taxi uh, uh, Council, Agricultural Business Chambers, uh, consulting engineers, the bus operators, SAIA, the South African Insurance uh, uh, Association, who, whose members and customers are impacted by bad roads. The cost of insurance goes up. All of these organizations have a role to play when it comes to demanding the services from government that we pay taxes for. They pay company taxes, they take PAYE from the employees, they pay a VAT, all this money goes into government's coffers and government squanders it and maladministers it and corruptly uses that fund. And we sit back and we moan and we don't hold them to account. What does holding them to account mean? It means demanding 
to meet in the association space so you protect your members. They don't have to stick their heads up because I'm very aware of what happens as the CEO at Avis when I stuck my neck up to uh, wearing a Savrala hat to challenge an irrational ETOL scheme. The company got attacked. So I know how companies can be attacked, which is why your associations need to defend them and prevent them from being attacked by government, but and bullied by government, by the way. And I'm not just saying that, it happens. It happens, you get threatened from being pulled off, uh, taken off procurement lists, uh, additional audits being done in your business. I've seen the mails. So this bullying effect takes place. What happens, business just pulls back. I don't like to get into the fight. But unfortunately, if you don't, you allow the status quo to continue and get worse. So you have to start standing up as business. You have to start shaking government's tree, not because you want to, not because you've got time, because you have to. Because if you don't, then government will continue to allow the degradation to happen, and we'll continue to moan. And we'll continue to see death on our roads because I don't have to tell you about the regional roads now. We're getting calls from big agricultural unions, uh, trucking companies are using these roads saying, what are we going to do about it? Well, the question I have for them is, what are you going to do about it? When are you going to go to NEDLAC? When are you going to call the Minister of Transport? When are you going to participate in your role and your oversight and your challenge to government to say enough of this? We cannot carry on like it. So on the second issue of accountability for road safety I mentioned was policies and regulations. I don't want to go too deeply into that. I mean, naturally, this is the domain of government. Uh, and our constitution is very strong when it comes to forming policies and uh, regulations. Government needs to consult. Government needs to get the input of society and the stakeholders. And again, we've found missing in action so often when these regulations come out. To be, uh, and then when they're passed, we say, well, how did that happen? R2 is just one of those. R2, we're not opposed as ATA to R2 and, 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 and the adjudication and the efficient administration of traffic infringements or a demerit point system. But you cannot introduce policies and regulations of that nature if they're unworkable, if they're unenforceable. And I'll get to enforcement uh, uh, um, after this, but you know, we saw this in ETOLs where we said we understand the technology. It works in many countries around the world. We understand the efficiencies of it. And we understand the principle of user pays. But if you introduce policies and schemes where it's not a user pay scheme, it's some users pay. If you introduce schemes and policies where people can run roughshod over them, you can have cloned number plates, people get traffic fines, they don't even get those traffic fines, you don't follow due process as the government in getting the fines to the people through the uh, postal system, not everybody's on the internet, they just assume that and we're going to send it to you by SMS or WhatsApp. How does the rest of the, uh, con uh, the, the country and, and, and the public participate in processes that they cannot participate in? And so you have this downward spiral because people start learning from each other how to circumvent the regulations, get around them, skirt around them, and, uh, and the schemes collapse. And then it comes down to this issue of enforceability. So, you know, I think people in authority suffer from this notion that, that everybody just wants to live in a lawless and chaotic environment. So we're going to put these administrative burdens and processes in place to really stifle them. But all they do when they do that is get people to walk away from compliance. They don't understand, as Lee was saying in her presentation, the ethics is that society wants to participate in the law-abiding uh, space, in, in, in an organized space. Uh, and when they're forced to not comply, or if they cannot comply, then they're forced to not comply. And that's why you have people buying slots for driver's licenses, because it's difficult and then buying their driver's licenses. And, you know, this is one country where I think it's safe to say that you can drive in South Africa's roads with an unroadworthy vehicle, with an unlicensed vehicle, with no driver's license, and probably get away with it 
for your life. That is the shocking reality, which brings me to this third port, port, uh, point of enforcement and enforceability, and they're two different things. It's one thing to have the best roads in the land, the best laws that you can govern them. But if you don't enforce, then nothing happens. Then people will start behaving uh, in an unlawful manner. Then they will jump traffic lights. Then they will speed. They will drink and drive because they don't get caught. And this notion that, well, we'll just put up more cameras. Cameras are not the solution for picking up when people jump traffic lights or speed. The conduct, the bad conduct, the unsafe road conduct, it does not get picked up by cameras. So don't think that camera traps are around enforceability. It isn't. The sad reality is that cameras are being used by municipalities and metros because it's a form of revenue generation. It's got very little to do with road safety. And you see it in the budgets. And you see it in towns that say, okay, we're running low, we, can, we need to earn more money. And they put up more cameras to get money. So the, the problem is that when it comes down to enforceability, if your native system is incorrect and the authorities are unable to serve notices uh, and of infringements, um, the public don't, are unable to uh, capitalize on the time frames that gives them the discount. You know, when you start charging somebody for 1,000 rand at a fine, but say if you pay in 30 days, we'll give you 500 rand. For. That's not how you run traffic enforcement. You don't entice people with discounts. You find them. If it's a thousand rand fine, find them. Make them pay a thousand rand, but follow due process as government to make sure the fine gets to them on time. Do the work properly. So this lack of enforcement is, is, uh, is a big problem. If you have laws and, the, and they're enforceable, that's one thing. Then you've got to do the enforcement. And enforcement comes with, with um, uh, visible policing. Um, and our problem there is that is that we, we, we really struggle when it comes to uh, this enforcement uh, process in, in this country. We need to make sure that um, our municipalities are not uh, just hiding behind cameras and, and, and they need to be get, get out on the road and they need to remove cars that are unroadworthy. They need to remove and find drivers that are driving with expired or, or no licenses at all, or vehicles with no licenses. So just in closing, I want to say that everything I mentioned above doesn't necessarily uh, negate the need for the individual or businesses and the good work that we do in the training space. We must continue to do that. In fact, we need to probably do a lot more of it. <clears throat> uh, that's never going to stop. But it's this relationship with the state that we have as individuals and the state has with its individuals. It's this building of a culture of road safety. Um, if you go to countries where road safety, uh, 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 I mean, we're in, the, we're in the worst quartile when it comes to fatalities and, and death on our roads. But you go to countries where that isn't the case. People don't mind the strong laws and rules, but you won't find clon cloned number plates. You won't find people jumping traffic lights. You'll find people driving within the stringent laws that are set. So we want to operate in a space where there are laws. But if, you, if the government is not going to do their part in making sure that we have safe roads, that the money is well spent, that we enforce our laws and we put in regulations that make sense and stop going off on this tangent that, well, if we, you know, maybe we should just lower the kilometer speed on the roads from 120 to 100. Well, you can lower them to 60 if you want. You can just slow the whole country down if you really want to. But that's not the issue. The autobahn in, 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 in Germany uh, at unlimited speeds, it's not an issue. People can drive at those speeds if the road is safe and if it's well maintained, they've got the capabilities to do so. I'm not saying we, we change our 120 limit and we remove that. It's not an unsafe speed to drive at. It is all the other factors. So what I'm, in, I'm asking us as individuals and us as business associations to do, start playing our role in saying to government, what are you doing about getting the culture of road safety rights in this country? What are you doing with the money that you're receiving from the taxpayer when it comes to fixing and maintaining our roads?
and get involved in the sessions that government uh, uh, invites you to and invites the society to when it comes to regulations and systems and processes. We need to challenge more. We need to become active as corporate citizens and we need to stop fearing government's bullying. Stand up for your rights and let's make government start working for its citizens. And that way, I think, in the road space and the Department of Transport space, we'll start addressing road safety more meaningfully because lip service and talking about decades of road safety for years now hasn't done a thing. Our fatalities will continue unless we hold our government to account. Thank you very much. How do you feel after a discussion like that? Eh? Quite profound. And really it sensitizes us to the reality of the world that we live in. So Wayne, thank you very much for being here. By the way, he's staying. Uh, he's fobbed off his other appointment. We're more important. So thanks again. All right. Uh, by the way, I know we run in a fair amount over time, guys. Please, to the extent that you can change your schedules or whatever, do so because you will win some prizes. We've got uh, two more presentations before we take a short break. So I'd like to introduce uh, Kuda Takura. He's from Ford Motor Company. And we're going to look at the ethics related to the applications that we find in modern vehicles. And I'll give you one for example. MySync on Ford enables you to engage in a telephone discussion while mobile. Ethically, is that correct? Let's have a look at and listen to Kuda. Thank you. Morning all. Great to be here. Thank you for uh, accommodating us in the schedule. I'm just going to give a little bit of time to the technical team to uh, sort out the connection. Um, as things stand at the moment, we had a little bit of a challenge with transferring my presentation. Being a corporate entity, we have tons and tons of restrictions. So our USBs are blocked and we are not allowed to uh, access SharePoints. So we've just tried to work out a solution. I see the presentation is up. So I'll just grab the clicker and hopefully we can progress with that. I think there's gonna be a slight change for those who have uh, connected online. So as soon as I get the thumbs up there, we can kick on. Okay, perfect. So, oh, just one thing. Yeah, okay, great. So I just saw a check to make sure the clicker's working and not quite as yet aha needs to be powered on of course great so another introduction good morning everyone the name is kuda takura the name was mentioned earlier on i am part of the cx team in the img group that is a lot of acronyms we in corporate are great at stuff like that so img stands for international markets group and our oversight is mostly around the slide that you see up on the screen. I'm not going to dwell on this at all, but this is what I spend and my team, the balance of our working days, just literally obsessing over. And it's got to do with our customers' experience of the Ford brand. In and out, um, you see that's our journey wheel, and you see at the top there something that says treat customers like family. That's going to be very rep repetitive during the course of my presentation. It is a key foundational pillar along uh, some of the elements that Ford as a business have pulled together in terms of how we will be progressing forward into the future. So with that said, it was also beneficial for us to give you a little bit of context. Um, I know that I am not supposed to do a selling job here today, but it is beneficial to be contextual as well. So just wanted to give you a little bit of understanding as to Ford as it's in its presence in South Africa and where we are, where we're going over the next couple of years. So just a little bit of background information. So some of you would have heard um, around last year or so, uh, there was a huge amount of noise made around an investment that our parent company, Ford in Detroit made in South Africa. That was a billion US dollars that at the time in, in terms of the um, exchange rate converted to about 15.8 billion. This was to support 
investments in our local production. Uh, both plants, we have a assembly plant in Silverton and Pretoria, and we have an engine plant in Struendale. And both these plants were recipients of uh, different forms of the investment. Overall, the bulk of that did go through to our plant in Silverton, where we assemble Ranger and Everest, and into the future will only be Ranger, but together with the future VW Amarok. And so that investment has seen a huge uh, flurry in terms of job opportunities as well as our supplier park. So there are a couple of visuals I'll show you just now that will also support that, as well as assisting us in becoming a bit more carbon neutral. I say a bit, there's tons of solar panels that have been installed at our plant in excess of about 80,000 of them. But in total, they went live about a month and a half ago, and they're only providing 30% of the power. Um, it, you would imagine that they'll be providing at least 70 to 80 if you see the scale of the project, but um, this is one of our first initiatives that we'll continue to build on as we try to bring that together. So this is just some visuals to support a lot of the work that's gone into that. And um, key point of interest, a lot of the engines made in Struendale actually go out for export as well. So we're very proud of our operations out in Struendale, that's in Port Elizabeth. Okay. So uh, with that background covered, um, now I've got up on the screen what we call our Ford Plus deliverables. You can see the uh, Ford Plus icon just uh, to the left of the presentation. And this is useful in terms of the conversation that we're gonna have today. Again, I'm still setting the scene, but useful in terms of getting you to understand why we do what we do, who we are as Ford and where we're going to. So in today's environment, it is absolutely key that we keep a keen eye on these deliverables. These were pulled together probably about a year and a half ago as we had a change in senior leadership in the US. As you know, in US companies are referred to the people at the top as president, vice president, etc. So our new president, um, Jim Farley, worked together with the greater team as, as, as well as our local MDs and our cross-regional partners to come up with these um, deliverables. They're very simplistic. I'm sure a lot of you have already combed your eyes over them and thought, yeah, that looks very doable. And some, in some instances, just base expect expectations that you would have of an organization. It's been critical for us to turn around automotive operations within Ford. There has never been a more challenging time than now for traditional OEMs. Competition is no longer defined by who has history in the space so who has competence in building fast engines or great driving cars the present competitive environment is made up of a whole host of players um, some are people who only have skills in computing others have skills in the space of battery development and in each and every counter uh, we're seeing that present more and more and they get into their little huddles get a bit of a venture uh, investment and before you know it they have a vehicle available and so the challenge has been really strong for us as we make that evolution and part of that is a challenge for south africa as well moving from internal combustion engines into alternative powertrains being hybrids and battery technologies to do so, we are going to look to disrupt ourselves, the way in which we've always managed our business and the way in which we've gone about that. And part of that as a core driver is having must-have products and services. I'm not sure how many amongst us today are Ford drivers. If you are, I'm pretty sure you would admit that we make some pretty great cars. And what we want to do now is marry that with great services, because the service expectation is equally as key uh, for customers in today's environment. They're coming from a banking experience where their app works seamlessly, or where they engage socially, be it on the platforms that we know, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, that are constantly being updated and brought up to a level where you can do things very quickly. And then they move into the sales environment for Ford or the purchase environment and after sales where we continue to want to pick up the phone or have you come to the dealership. And that is not in sync with where people's lifespans are in terms of how they expect things to happen. So we are spending tons of resources and time in building up the service end to marry with today's expectations, also in part driven by some of the international players as well. To do that, we'll partner for expertise and do that with the right partners accordingly. You see, treating like customers 
between customers like family repeated. I will come back to this point. It is definitely something I'm going to ram home as we continue to move along. Caring for each other speaks to a lot of our CSR initiatives. We are aware of our presence and how we need to account for that accordingly. So there's a lot that we do as a business, but that's not really today's focus. And then lastly, obviously, modernizing to keep abreast and pace with where the industry is moving to. So that's a little bit of context overall. I hope that's made sense because now we can get into the rub of today's space and speaking to driver assistance technologies. And in that context, um, as we speak to them as Ford, there are principally five levels of automation. And this is, I would say, accepted within the industry. So we've come from a space of zero automation. This was basically you, your mirrors, rear view, so on and so forth, and your concentration. That is all you had. And I think that accounted for the best drivers amongst us. We have now are sitting mostly in a position of level one, which is some form of driver assistance. Now, Ford was one of the biggest key players in what we call democratizing driver assistance technologies in South Africa. We started this journey back in 2012, 2013. Products like Focus, Everest, Ranger started receiving small bits of technology, probably in the upper series of these derivatives, and we'll talk about that challenge as well, that allowed you to have, for example, blind spot assistance. Um, and then we got into lane departure warning, then we got into adaptive cruise control, um, fatigue detection, so on and so forth. And that's continued to build. And I'm pretty sure if any of you have recently bought a new car, you're finding some of these features integrated. Uh, by show of hands, who, who does have some of this content? Great. I love some interaction. I'll follow that up with another question. How many of you find it annoying? Okay. Two hands there. Okay. Annoying to a point where you switch off the functionality? Yeah. Some don't switch off 100%. Would you like them to be switched off to have the option? Yeah. So I think if you're a very attentive driver who's in their space and knows very well what they're doing, it can be very annoying to have those present. And that's part of the conundrums, and we'll discuss it as we move along, um, that we are constantly looking at as part of the engagements and discussions we have with our teams when we are deciding where these technologies should be and how we should integrate them into the experience. Because at the same time, uh, the, challenge, the opposite challenge is also true of them being almost technologically difficult to understand. So we've come in and the people say, oh, I see this thing blinking up or this car is constantly beeping. I do not know what this means. We have had reports of customers coming back and stating that they can't quite deal with the beeping. And as the gentleman mentioned, in some instances, you cannot switch those technologies off. And we've sold it to you. We've positioned it. We've packaged it as a positive that through adaptive cruise control, you have, for example, the means to set your desired speed and the vehicle will manage the braking and acceleration between you and the vehicle in front. It does this through cameras and so on and so forth. But for some, the beeping of you're getting too close or the beeping warning that may then say the vehicle ahead has stopped too abruptly, so on and so forth, is unnerving. It's actually not a benefit. It's not a positive. So they don't feel confident behind the wheel. So we've been looking at some of these things and our journey started in what we almost call yesterday, today and tomorrow. So from a driver assistance perspective, yesterday's tech, which you see in brackets here, we say personal, was almost around you, right? So this was simplistic things, parking sensors, cameras, was very fancy a couple of years back, but has now become a norm and almost an expectation. And as it's been cascaded, the cheaper it's become. Hence, you're seeing this on entry level vehicles and the like, and it's very beneficial. But that progression, um, and well, sorry, before I talk about the progression, this was actually something as well that was um, key to the PR team for me to share um, and looking at us from a testimonial perspective and very, I think, relevant uh, relative to the conversation we had earlier on. And this is just a gentleman who got in touch who was unfortunately in an, in, in an accident in the 2013 uh, Ford Focus and got away perfectly fine, unfortunately, having been hit. 100 kilometers an hour with the vehicle knocked 35 meters can be very violent in these instances in the way these things take shape. But this is part of the journeys that we continually want to be um, hoping that we come away from, um, especially in situations like this. 
But keeping that along, you heard me mention yesterday, then we get into today, which is semi-autonomous and a couple of examples of that beneath that. And that's a bit more interpersonal because there is a reliance, not just on the driver, but also more broadly on the spaces around you. Then the third being independent. Now this is fully autonomous. The visual that you see, this is happening today. This is what Ford calls Blue Cruise, where you have the means to take your foot off the accelerator, your hands off the wheel, and the car will do the driving for you. So this is now moving from level two up into level three levels of autonomy. This works on select roads and freeways, and it is something that we hope to expect to see on our next generation product, which we are closing in on. Um, some of these vehicles will be rolling out over the balance of the quarters of this year. But if I come back to the position of treating customers like family, and the challenge that we have around that is we've just built up a viewpoint. Now, these are some of the social um, market specific customer relative challenges that we have. And if we go through them block by block, we can almost identify and isolate some of the things that we grapple with in the industry as well. The first one being variable industry and global standards to safety. So you may not know this, but um, in Europe, for example, you can no longer sell a vehicle new, whether it's the cheapest entry level vehicle or anything above that, unless it has some of the technologies we spoke of earlier. Key amongst those are pre-collision assist and lane departure warning. Those are mandatory in market. And as OEMs, Ford being one of them as well, they have found a solution to make that available. In South Africa, we can, and we do obviously have conversations with our partners and what we grapple with is the cost component. Because in South Africa, there is a, and our research backs us up, a preference to cost, right? So how low can your installment be over any other consideration? We've looked at data as well where we've amplified safety and it's amongst one of the weakest measures, weakest attributes that customers look at when shopping. So style, performance, fuel economy, especially now with where the price of fuel is, those are predominantly of greater importance. Even the brand will trump that. So um, there are many brands that sell on safety alone or have at least tried to do so. I do not need to mention them. I think you know who they are but that does not translate into them being market leaders within their segments. So it's very difficult for us in market when we're needing to make these calls because you can be in that position where you increase the cost and then try market it, but you undoubtedly end up losing on share. The social, moral and regulatory challenges are also something where we need to look at. So we've been in a position where a lot of the technologies that, the, that come in these vehicles are in a point where there are challenges for us in terms of how customers will utilize those vehicles. I've attempted to drive on national roads with my adaptive cruise on, for example, because work is in Pretoria, I stay in Johannesburg. So it's very useful to leverage this technology, see how it operates. Guess how many car lengths the adaptive cruise control system thinks I should have between me and the car in front of it? Three is correct. Guess how many people in this room leave three car lengths gap between themselves and the car in front of them? Yeah, absolutely none, maybe one or two. And that's part of the challenge. And, and in those instances, we find ourselves coming back to that earlier point about people then complaining, saying, oh no, it buzzes too much, it makes too many noises, so on and so forth, because the system is working within what is safest, but we think we know best, just probably two, maybe three meters gap, got to be really on that bumper because if I'm not, someone's going to push in or think I'm moving too slowly. And if we look beyond that as well, we look at cost barriers versus the content. So our product marketing team, there's a separate department that looks at this, are always in that position as well. This is something that we grapple with. I mentioned earlier on that the majority of these technologies you find on the upper series. That is not a mistake because it's much easier to then convince a customer when they're coming in and buying what we would call platinum, titanium, wild track, upper end series, that they've got everything, right? We've thrown the kitchen sink in. So it might be at the back of their minds that, oh yeah, it's great, I get all this other safety content, but it's definitely not at the forefront of what they purchase a vehicle for. It's much easier for us to package that content in 
uh, because the total cost when you're buying at the upper tier means that we've uh, covered those uh, costs lower down in the sphere. Active versus passive safety industry calls, also very critical. So the airbags that we were talking about earlier on in terms of your passive safety versus your active, constantly scanning and looking around the surroundings, there's a difference in terms of cost for those things. And we are always in a position where we need to be a bit more uh, aware as to what that impact will be. Speaking of impact, the chip shortage, which I think a lot of you are now familiar with, as it's been spoken about in the motoring industry, continues to hinder this progress. Um, this was something that was working perfectly in terms of reducing overall cost. And now we're back to square one because there is a huge rush for chip shortages and that is affecting widespread availability and you're actually finding some feature content is being removed and if i go back to my earlier point about what customers preferences and what the data shows us it can sometimes be to these things in driver assistance because there isn't a high want amongst customers and then finally customer attitudes towards safety and feature content very very low locally which is shocking considering what we've seen today, what's been spoken to, and how some of these technologies could help us. But these are the things that within the teams we grapple with. And beyond that as well, out of scope from the circle of treating customers like family and the importance of that is now what we look at in terms of what we have to lobby in our space. So we actively are trying this as Ford. We know that globally the movement towards autonomous vehicles is happening. We can't slow that acceleration down. We know that it will be something that will be cascaded like everything else, starting in US, Europe, and China, which is a huge player now, will eventually cascade into our local market. So knowing that in advance, we have to work on the points of societal ex acceptance. And that's part of that education and working with Eugene and the team. I think that's a great opportunity for us to be able to do that. The regulatory environment is also key. I've heard that inferred during parts of the presentation today. It is something that's also key critical that we continue to lobby and position government for. It would be absolutely phenomenal if we could have a standing position that says minimum front dual airbags and side curtain airbags, whether you're buying a bottom of the end Figo, which has those features, mind you, or going all the way up top to a Mustang, for example. That should be a requirement together with pre-collision assist, which in, I think, our children's generation will look back and wonder how we ever got into cars that would have the ability in 2020 to drive into themselves without, a, without forewarning. So those are some of the things to consider. And then we obviously need to work with our insurance partners in this context, because the issue of liability, which you see at the very uh, last point, comes up more often than not. So if a car makes a decision on your behalf, who holds that liability, especially once we get to full points of total automation. So those are the things that we've been working through. I hope that's given you a bit of a sense. I believe we're a little time pressured, so I will uh, close off there, but it's great to have been in your company. Thank you. Thanks, Kuda. Thanks, Kuda. I must just say this while Kuda is here. You've seen we've got a, a collection of Ford products outside. By the way, you can enroll in a high performance training program, which is a Ford Mustang. Do you know who paid for that Ford Mustang? It wasn't Ford. So please, if there's any pressure that you can uh, bring to bear on a manufacturer to support driver training, talk to him while he's here. Don't let him out the door, please. So thank you very much. Guys, um, I'd now like to introduce Ivana Reese. Can I just give you her, uh, her bio? She's a professional close quarter combat. Krav Maga and Tactical for offering specialized training for police, military, CPOs, and a whole lot of other things. And then he has a comment. She teaches situational awareness, de-escalation, and avoidance of violence. It's a reality. We have hijackings on our road. I don't know if you noticed, truck hijackings, 900% up, hey? 900%. Passenger vehicles, not as bad. So that's you and I, gratefully. But how do we deal with the situation Excuse me, when, for example, you're in a car park and you are a vulnerable road user, and don't just look at women, eh? That's everybody. How would you deal with that? Ivana, please come up and share your knowledge with us.
Good morning. And um, thank you so much to Master Drive for the invitation to share my passion and uh, experience and knowledge with you and to the virtual audience as well. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> I was asked to speak on counter-offensive skills for vulnerable road users. I am going to need that in a moment. I can manage with this for now. Um, so let's just look at the title of that, counter-offensive skills for vulnerable road users. Who exactly qualifies as a vulnerable road user? In my world, pretty much everyone. That does not mean that you have to be the driver of the vehicle. You can be the passenger, you can be using public transport, you can be in an Uber. As long as you are on the road, in my world, and the reality in South Africa, as Eugene said, you are a vulnerable road user. So where does the word counteroffensive uh, come into the whole mix? I am a, a black belt in Krav Maga, and I spend my days equipping people with uh, skills to defend themselves. I don't like the word self-defense at all. Self-defense gives you the idea that you're on the back foot defending against a situation. Counteroffensive is an entirely different mindset. It is a mindset that says to someone, do you really want to attack me? Because if you are going to do that, this is going to be a really bad day for you. And it's an entirely different mindset. So um, when we talk about uh, counteroffensive skills, first of all, that's the, that's the first thing you have to plug into the equation. Right. So we've now determined who um, is a, a vulnerable um, road user. So what is the best counteroffensive skill? The best defense, although I don't like the word, is to not be there in the first place. Don't be there. So that's easier said than done. Great, so don't be there. How do you not be there? You, you start off, the, the, the best thing to do is to actually be situationally aware. And you know, this is a word that is bandied around all the time. Oh, be situationally aware. How exactly are you supposed to be situationally aware? What are you looking for? You are looking for the thing that doesn't fit the picture. Every situation has a baseline behavior. And when something doesn't fit, either by its presence or just as much by its absence, that is something to take notice of. Example, you're sitting in gridlock traffic and um, you have kept your following distance from the car in front of you as all good road users do. And um, you notice someone walking in between the traffic move across a bit okay you notice someone walking in the traffic in between the cars and um, they've got their hands in their pockets immediately all the warning bells have to go off what's in their pockets why are they walking in between the traffic in gridlock traffic and what's in their pockets example hot day guys wearing a uh, a, a very hot long sleeve jacket doesn't fit the picture the next problem we encounter is that then people don't trust their gut instinct. They go, oh, probably just imagining it. No, you're not. So when you think something is off, guys, it's off. Please take note of that. Now, um, in terms of when are you most vulnerable, unless you are driving a cash and transit vehicle or you're carrying um, high value goods you are most vulnerable when you're stationary or when you're driving extremely slowly. So when are you stationary? All of us are stationary on a regular basis while we're driving on the road, approaching a traffic light that's red. So here is standard protocol to keep yourself safe in that situation. If you're driving towards a red traffic light, number one, we all know, keep your following distance. But the second thing, and the most important thing, if I leave you with nothing today except for this, your best defense is not your physical skills. Your best defense are your soft skills, and that is your eyes, what you see. So you need to be situationally aware. You need to be looking for the thing that is the anomaly. What could stop you from doing that distraction? Being on your cell phone, 
traffic light. Oh, quickly, just check this email. Quickly, just check that WhatsApp message. How many of us do that? You know, we, we're all guilty of that. The second thing, guys, is focus locks. Focus locks. How many of you have been in a traffic scenario where someone knocks on your window, you're at a tra lead traffic, a red traffic light, and they've got a whole lot of car chargers? They want to sell you a car charger. So you are now trying to convince the guy on this side that you really don't need a car charger. What's going on on this side? This is a focus lock. You're entirely distracted on what's going that way. In the same way, you drive past an accident scene and everyone cranes their necks to look at what's going on and you're driving extremely slowly. What's happening on this side? Focus locks are important to be aware of. Another thing is when you um, are driving, and guys, this is not paranoia and it's not fear. This is actually the complete opposite of that. It's an empowering thing. Have a weapon handy. I'm not saying that you need to carry a firearm, but have a weapon handy. So what is a weapon? It can be anything. Now, for the people who are watching this virtually, especially if you're in another country, you'd obviously have to be cognizant of the law in your country. But if you are in a vehicle and you have a knife with you, I carry several. And, <laughs> um, and if someone wants to break my window, well, go ahead. Um, in terms of if you don't want to carry a knife, pepper spray. But pepper spray, is it's not a weapon, guys, unless it's in your hand. Having, you know, if you, I'm a firearms instructor and I teach people to shoot. At the end of the day, having a weapon and accessing it are two entirely different things. So unless you plan on spending hours and hours on practicing your weapon access, the best thing to do is put the weapon in your hand when you need it. So when do you need it? At the traffic light. I drive with my knife underneath my thigh and I, I'm there at uh, every traffic light I'm at. Um, and guys, I say this, I became a firearms instructor and I became a Krav Maga instructor because of being attacked five times. So I'm not speaking about the hypothetical, I'm speaking about reality and what does happen. Next thing, um, where else are you stationary? In a parking lot. Let's talk about approaching your vehicle. Um, you are leaving your office, you are leaving your home, wherever you are, your shopping center, you're approaching your vehicle. Before you head towards your vehicle, please guys, two things need to happen. You need to have your car keys in your non-dominant hand, your non-dominant hand, and your weapon in your dominant hand. That does not mean that you should walk around if you carry, I mean, I've got a, a, a switchblade here. I don't want you to walk around the parking lot like this. Um, you have the, you have the knife. <laughs> You have the knife in your hand. This does not look threatening to the car guards, to the other people around you. You're simply armed. The keys are in your non-dominant hand. Your handbag, ladies, is on your non-dominant shoulder because this is your fighting arm. If you're left-handed, obviously, conversely. So your keys are in your left hand. You know, people say, oh, use your keys as a weapon, guys. Keys, if you, if you put them, if people say, oh, hold your keys like this and you're gonna punch someone. It's gonna perforate your hand. Don't do that. Keys are actually great as a weapon if you don't have enough, but you use it to slash or you use it, you hold the keys like this. If you have multiple keys on a key ring, you hold one key and the rest of the keys become a striking um, tool. If you don't have keys and you only have a small uh, remote, this is your weapon, or alternatively, your paper spray. As I say, it's only a weapon when it's on you and it's in your hand. Next thing, you're approaching the vehicle. Guys, obviously, stating the obvious, don't be on your cell phone. Don't be distracted. Posture. I'm going to show you two pictures. Picture one, I'm walking to my car, and I'm sorry if I'm walking out of the line of the camera, but I'm walking to my car and I'm like this. If you were a... Um, a criminal, choose your target, target one or target two. Which one would you choose? 
because Target 2 has a, a vibe about them that says, don't mess with me. And if you see something that you don't feel happy with, please make eye contact. In South Africa, we have this thing that we don't make eye contact with people. When you see someone that you don't like, you need to look at them and you need to say, I've seen you. Not from the point of view of trying to promote violence. I'm exactly on the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's try and de-escalate violence. It's not to try and bait them into some sort of fight. It's simply to say, I've seen you. Don't mess with me. Next thing, when you get in the car, don't sit there on your cell phone swiping or get in the car, lock your car, start the car, reverse, get out. So those are just some very, very basic things, guys. I could sit and talk to you about this topic for an entire week. Unfortunately, because of lack of time um, and my uh, re real um, talk, uh, the, the purpose of the talk is really to do a demo for you. Um, I'm going to switch straight on to that. And in a moment, I'm going to ask for someone who would be um, prepared to be an assistant attacker um, to come and help me. Um, <laughs> And, um, and also, um, I'm going to be, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, and, and in a moment, I'm actually going to ask you to stand up and find someone to strangle. We'll teach you how to deal with that in a moment. <laughs> okay. Um, guys, in the limited time that we have, my hope is that you will walk out of here with some usable skills. It takes a lot of time to practice to become a human walking weapon. And we can't do that in two minutes. But something all of you have right now sitting where you are is your voice. If you get attacked, scream, shout, make a noise. Someone tries to push you into the car, use your leg against the edge of the car so that they can't get you into the car. The next thing is your targets. Everyone has fingers. You don't need to be highly trained to put your fingers in somebody's eye. If an attacker comes towards you and you can reach their eye, go for their eyes. An attacker who can't see can't attack. The next thing, if you're going to punch, and actually 80% of my clients are men and everybody wants to punch. I'm sorry, I'm just, that's just the reality I face. The guys want to punch. Guys, it's often multiple attackers. You break your hand on attacker number one, you don't have a hand for attacker number two. Don't punch a hard surface like a, a, a chin. Punch into the throat. That's a soft area, ladies. Eyes, scratch, punch into the throat, knee to the groin. Those are your basics that anyone can do with minimal training. Um, and on that note, I don't, I'm going to put the mic down now because, um, you know, we're going to demo, so uh, forgive me for not having a mic. Can I just... Um, oh, great, we're back online. Okay, 
So someone comes and throws you up against the car and puts the, the knife at your chest and says, give me your money. Here is the self-defense move for that. Guys, it's very complicated. It looks like this. Give them your money. They say, I want your cell phone. Give me your cell phone. I want your car keys. Give me your cell phone. Get into the car. Not today. And from here. <laughs> that's not going to happen today. So that's, I can't teach that today in one lesson, but that's to, just to give you some example of some of the things you can do. You've been great, but don't run away yet. <laughs> um, that just gives you some example of what you can do with a little bit of training. And I train people from all walks of life, and, and everyone's able to do this. It takes minimal training. Another example is um, so, someone comes up to you and puts a gun at your head. Please don't put your finger in the trigger guard because it'll break. Rather, just hold it. Hold it like that. And yeah, yeah. So someone comes up and puts a gun at your head. Now, guys, 90% of gun disarms fail. Think of it logically. If he's got his finger on the trigger and I just have to do this, he, I've got a far longer distance to travel than he has. So 90% of gun disarms fail. Don't go and do a gun disarm unless you're highly skilled at it, and even so, try and avoid it if possible. The most important part of a gun disarm is the don't die part. The don't die part is making sure you get your head offline. So from here, if he has to do this, boom, you'd actually be out, and you'd, you'd actually have to get out. So that gives you an example. If he puts it at your chest, again, uh, the don't die part. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And guys, also, if, you, if you're dead still and you suddenly do this, he's going to pull the trigger. Whereas, you know, if you're constantly in motion, he doesn't know when you're going to pull the trigger. The other thing is, you know, um, you know, the art of warfare is distraction. Sorry, by the way, I forgot to ask you, what's your name? <laughs> so the moment that he answers, that's the moment that he can't think of what he's doing because he's busy answering a question. You wouldn't ask him what his name is. You'd ask him what he wants, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You've been amazing, but would you mind staying here for another moment? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, guys. So now we're going to get on to some practical stuff that you can do. Um, I'm going to show you uh, one of the most, the, the easiest things and the most common attacks that happen. So you are going to grab me like this. So you're heading towards your car, someone grabs you like this. What you're going to be doing, guys, most of the time when you're in this situation, you can't breathe. And people panic and they start trying to pull this away. You can't. Look at his strength, look at my strength. Now, guys, you might, a lot of the guys I teach, I've got a guy that I teach at six foot ten at the moment. And I always I say to even, even to someone like that, there's someone bigger and stronger than you. Be careful. Don't assume that you're stronger than the person. You can't pull this arm away. So you do the exact opposite. You pull it towards you. If you pull an arm towards you, look what happens to my neck. I have space to breathe. The second thing is you've got to get out. So you're going to take a big step out to the side. I'm going to try and do this without breaking the mic here. And, and the next thing is your, your easiest target, and I'm not going to hit you, by the way, is you're going for the groin. <laughs> when you're doing that, guys, he's going, to, he's going to lower. Look where his head is. He's going to lower, which gives you an uppercut elbow. Once you've got that, hang on to this. Seeing we're at Auto Mechanica and Advanced Driving and uh, Master Drive, this is a good one to remember. Reverse the car. Reverse the car. Get out. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so, guys, would you like to try and learn that? Do you want to find someone to strangle and let's just do it together? <laughs> you don't have to. Oh, time is short. Okay. So, guys, um, all right, we won't have a chance to do that, but just to give you some ideas, um, the last thing I want to demo, which is the most important thing, is if someone comes towards you and you're not skilled at all, Go for the eyes. Eyes, throat, groin, ten pin bowling. One, two, three. <laughs> Sorry. It's, um, okay. Thank you so much.
Guys, give her a big round of applause. Huh? You know. And what's my friend's name there? Prince. Hey, he's brave, eh? Just a hint, when you ever see Ivana at a stop street or traffic light, I wouldn't suggest you knock on a window, all right? You'll probably come off second best. Folks, we're going to take a 10-minute break now um, before we go on to the panel discussion about progress towards zero emission. Please do come back. I know we're running a fair amount over time, but have you benefited so far? Absolutely, and I trust the virtual audience. There's 80 in attendance at the moment. We only dropped nine. So that's well done. If there's anybody you know, please make sure that they join us. Give us 10 minutes. We will join the panel over here. We will be doing some prizes later, so please remember. And by the way, Yvonne, just confirm. I don't know how we're going to draw it yet. She's given a prize, correct? Okay. So, Prince, if you're brave enough, maybe you want to go for the course. All right. Okay, folks, let's take a 10-minute break. Uh, we will chase you up outside, coffee, toilet, etc. Thanks. Did you know cell phones are the number one cause of distraction for fleets? They account for nearly 47% of all distracted driving crashes. And on average, they cost your company $92,000, potentially climbing to millions. The solution is no cell. No cell is the industry leading hardware and software hybrid solution to enforce your company policy. No Cell is fully customizable for any fleet size, industry, or operations to maximize the balance between productivity and safety. How does it work? Your administrator can manage these settings for devices with permissions and access. Whitelist apps to balance safety with productivity. When the No Cell tags are permanently installed in your vehicles, and your drivers have No Cell installed on their devices, You're ready for no cell to enforce your customized policy when your vehicle goes into motion. When the trip is complete, no cell stops enforcing your policy and you gain full access to your device. View a wide variety of comprehensive trip data in the no cell portal. Fleet administrators can view individual trips and non-compliance alerts. What makes no cell the industry leader? Here's what you get. Scales for commercial fleets of two to 10,000 plus vehicles. Authorized apps to balance safety with productivity. Work seamlessly with in-cab cameras and telematics systems. Alerts for phone handling and unauthorized devices. Effectively prevents crashes and saves money by proactively removing cell phone distractions. Keep the roads safe. Protect your drivers and your company assets. Did you know cell phones are the number one cause of distraction for fleets? They account for nearly 47% of all distracted driving crashes. And on average, they cost your company $92,000, potentially climbing to millions. The solution is no cell. No cell is the industry leading hardware and software hybrid solution to enforce your company policy. No Cell is fully customizable for any fleet size, industry, or operations to maximize the balance between productivity and safety. How does it work? Your administrator can manage these settings for devices with permissions and access. Whitelist apps to balance safety with productivity. When the No Cell tags are permanently installed in your vehicles, and your drivers have No Cell installed on their devices, You're ready for no cell to enforce your customized policy when your vehicle goes into motion. When the trip is complete, no cell stops enforcing your policy and you gain full access to your device. 
View a wide variety of comprehensive trip data in the NoCell portal. Fleet administrators can view individual trips and non-compliance alerts. What makes NoCell the industry leader? Here's what you get. Scales for commercial fleets of 2 to 10,000 plus vehicles. Authorized apps to balance safety with productivity. Work seamlessly with in-cab cameras and telematics systems. Alerts for phone handling and unauthorized devices. Effectively prevents crashes and saves money by proactively removing cell phone distractions. Keep the road safe. Protect your drivers and your company assets.
Hello. Hello. Hi, folks. I should have added for this. Hi, folks. Can we get together, be seated, please? You want me to do it on the mic? Yes, go for it. Hello, people. We have three excited guests waiting for your attention. Excited. Very excited. Okay, folks, welcome back to the second round of our workshop. I think you will have seen on the background while you or while you were out, you may not have seen it. We had a picture on the wall or on the screen of what one ton of CO2 emissions looks like. Um, now, if you think about it and some of the figures that I'd like to share with you with regard to where we are at the moment, you know, China accounts for something like 9.9 .9 billion tons of CO2 emissions every year. The United States accounts for 4.58 billion tons and South Africa 435 million tons of CO2 emissions in a year. What is interesting though that in China each individual accounts for 7.41 tons, America 16 tons and in South Africa a measly 6.9 tons. Now if you compare that with Europe uh, the average person is 6.7 tons per person and in Africa which is why maybe the rate of progress will be slower, 0.8 of a ton of CO2 emissions every year. So it's against that background that we've got our panel here. And what I'm going to do is not share the intensive and comprehensive CVs with them. They're just going to do a brief intro to who they are and what they are, and they're going to keep it less than two seconds kind of thing. Eh? Okay, so there's the challenge, guys. Rick, let's start with you. Give us a background, who you are, why you're here. Hey, morning, guys. My name is Rick France. And I'm the founder of Aversa, which is a company focused on bringing to market commercial electric vehicles and the charging infrastructure to support them. Good day, everybody. I'm Eddie Cook. I'm a gas consultant for the RMI and mainly focusing on automotive gas for the last 20 years. Hi, everybody. Basil Govender. I represent Sabawa. Southern Af South African Bus Operators Association, and I would be keen to see how we can link all of this to get it to the forefront in the bus industry. Thank you. Thanks, Basil. By the way, Eddie said he stocked up and baked beans last night, so he makes his own gas for us. All right. All right. Let's direct the first one to Eddie then. The question we've got three questions posed. Um, what is the current progress in the automotive industry? which uses gas to reduce emissions. Give us your take on that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk international based, just to cover most of it. For the last 20 to 30 years, a lot of the vehicles due to Euro emission um, restrictions have turned to gas as an alternative fuel to reduce their carbon footprint. And therefore the development internationally for, as it's using for gas in vehicles, buses, um, trucks and everything like that in Europe and other international countries has been quite significant. How, however, in South Africa, not so significant at this stage, um, but we're getting there. And for that reason, there's already a lot of technology. And I must mention the gas technology used in automotive industry is more than 100 years old. So it's not a new thing. It's not a dangerous thing. And it's from all types of gas. We're talking from LPG, natural gas in the form of CNG, 
LNG, and lately there's even a lot of trials and tests being done on hydrogen in internal combustion engines and also on fuel cells as an alternative gas internationally. Thanks, Eddie. Just, just so that you know, the, uh, the zero or the aim towards zero is by 2050 that we should have zero emissions, which means by 2030, it should be half, and that's only eight years away. That's internal combustion engines. And if, if I recall the slide that we had shown just now, the biggest culprit for, redu for producing gas emissions is the diesel engine industry. So therefore, it makes natural sense to talk to what is happening in the bus industry and certainly in the commercial vehicle market. Rick, maybe I can just ask you, from where you are seated now, the EV, the transition to EVs, where is it in South Africa? And what do you think for the future? Um, so it's obviously in its extreme infancy now, and it feels to me like most corporates are ignoring it as best they can, but it's an inevitability, especially in the last mile delivery, and it really comes down to efficiencies. Um, a diesel engine is typically super inefficient, only converts about 20% of the total available energy in the diesel into forward movement. The rest is lost to heat and friction and um, various losses, whereas an electric motor can convert almost all of the energy that it gets from the battery pack into forward movement with only very minimal losses. So as a total energy conversion, electric vehicles make far more sense, and we'll see that adoption as, as time goes on. No, uh, the figure I had was 15% in a diesel or petrol engine gets used for forward motion, whereas in an electric, it's 85% of energy that's used effect effectively. Just let's talk to, to Eddie again. So now you gave us a worldview. In South Africa, where are we? The RMI conference, the other, yes, the day before, they had some gas vehicles on display. Yes, um, with the RMI, we launched the gas conversion project, and that was mainly to start, especially in the current state um, with, high crude oil prices to actually offer alternative, cheaper alternative, environmentally more alternative option of using gas. Um, it, it, we've been converting vehicles for more than 20 years in South Africa and some even longer. Forklifts have been running on gas for quite a while. And especially in the last 10 years, there was a lot of development. Um, I'm talking that in our country, over 200 buses are currently running on gas. In our country, there's um, been over 2,000 conversions of vehicles in the country, talking from taxis to fleet vehicles um, to even passenger cars that's been converted to run on gas. But we also, I would say, at the starting point and with the assistance of COVID and high crude oil prices, I think that drive will be a lot quicker. And with the conversion of vehicles and the plan with RMI and some of the OEMs that's busy testing dedicated gas vehicles in the country for the last five years, it will start developing a lot quicker. Thanks. Uh, yesterday, Saboa had their conference at Basel Europe Next. There was a lot spoken about alternative energies for the bus industry. Can you pick up on where Eddie has left off there? Where is the bus industry now? Confused. <laughs> but, but let me qualify. No better incentive at this point in time, given the way the fuel costs are going. Uh, uh, there were some serious statistics put up yesterday. But I think the challenge is not so much about what the bus industry wants to do. The appetite is there. The will is there. I, I will speak to some things that foreshadow it. Uh, the words policy uncertainty gets used a lot, but it's really a play on words. We have policies. It's the lack of certainty in the policy. So the bus industry is moving slowly, but uh, as Rick said, it, it's picking up pace, but it's almost like a wait and see. And unfortunately, the entire industry is dependent on how government thinks, how they craft a policy. And I want to position that the, the the industry is looking for a coming together 
same thing of the theme yesterday. We need partnerships, we need all the minds to come together, but certainly I'm looking as one of the leaders for the industry is to bring all the minds together, create a think tank, get a policy crafted and shaped it that we po position with government and then we have a founding document that takes us forward. So to answer your question specifically, there are things happening, but it's disjointed. It's not aligned. So our first step is to get everything aligned to be ready to take on the transition. Thanks, Basil. And if you were yesterday, I had the privilege of attending that conference. There's really great initiatives. But Rick, if I can talk to you, and then I'm going to follow up with you, Eddie. It's not one of the questions you posed, but what about the infrastructure, Rick, when it comes to EVs? What's the process? How can we believe that it's going to benefit us? And then, Eddie, if you can pick up on that afterwards as well for gas. Okay, that's the main question that we stuck with is there's no charges. So there's this chicken and egg problem. Nobody wants to bring trucks because there's no charges and vice versa. So we decided to just buy charges and trucks and start testing ourselves and running them in a bunch of fleets. It's not going to be up to ESCOM on their own. That's the first question we always get is can ESCOM power the charges? And there's this transition we need with decentralized power generation, solar, grid stationary storage, all these factors have to come into play. So the charges are there, they're available, and there is a network being built out now um, that's being developed in the public space, and we wanna develop it in the commercial space at the warehouse level, at the bus depot level, at the taxi rank level. Um, so yeah, we will be able to roll out the infrastructure with the support of all the right parties. From my side, I think the launch with RMI for the gas conversion process is basically where we deal with the consumers from heavy duty down to passenger vehicles to get the vehicles converted. Um, I want to copy the chicken egg scenario. When the vehicles are converted, we're gonna, where are we gonna fill these vehicles? And this is where we need to hold hands with um, the gas suppliers and also there's enough technology to actually be able to refuel these vehicles. It's a question, stop working in silos. Let's hold hand and actually build the infrastructure. Let's get to a point where we have a gas dispenser at every refueling point where you currently fill your petrol or diesel. And that's the way we're going to actually build the infrastructure. It's, it's not um, rocket science. It's stuff that's been done in other countries years ago, we can actually just copy and paste. Thanks, Eddie. Just a thought, you know, we speak about the move toward autonomous vehicles. And one question we get always asked is, autonomous vehicles will reduce or improve road safety. Yeah, it's a given, right? People make mistakes. Yet the three basic things that are needed for autonomous vehicles to work is a stable power system, stable power. Hey, what's that tell you? A 5G compatibility, and of course, a road infrastructure that's got the suitable markings. How far are we from that? I don't know. But maybe if I can just lead Basil with this question, and then the two of you, if you can follow up on it, what is needed for all role players to get on board, in your opinion? Absolutely critical step. Uh, and and just, just listening to the three of us speak here, the things happening, and, and with no disrespect intended, uh, the, the, the silo approach needs to just take a more integrated view going forward. We want the country to benefit. We want all our citizens to benefit and get a maximum out of it. So the first step is the coordinated approach. But the challenge for the bus industry, we can't fund what we have in an integrated solution, bringing in what is currently already perceived as an out of reach expense is almost prohibiting it. One of the first steps I want to advocate for, if there's a draft template model for the cost of implementing electric buses, alternative energy buses, and where savings can be generated with long-term projections, I think the industry will start buying into that. Currently, all testing and R&D is so expensive, it's almost stopping it right at the get-go. So this coordinated approach of who's got the info, who's got the lead, share without giving the trade secrets away, 
I almost get the sense at a personal level that somebody wants to be the game breaker. So we're keeping everything close. We're keeping everything closed without sharing too much. And it won't really benefit transition. Thank you. I, I must just share with you what happened at RMI when we were there the other day with the gas powered vehicles. Now we're interested for a number of reasons. And you know, the number of people with different things said, no, no, you, no, no, they get this from somebody else. You must rather talk to me. So as long as you have this, it's almost anti-competitive approach, are we going to succeed? Give us your take then, Eddie, on what is needed for role players to get on board, and then we'll go to Rick after that. Um, I'm going to take this from a basis where we say um, people don't want to share the cake, but I want to say we, we're at a point where we're still baking the cake. We don't know what's the size of the cake going to be. So we shouldn't be worried about at the moment who's going to get what size of the cake. We should actually team together and say, let's work, make it work. Let's bake the cake together and we can then share it. And I think there's a space for everybody in this situation, being it EV, being it gas related, there's space for everybody. There's so much development and so much infrastructure that needs to be put out there. And there's so much opportunity. So let's not worry about who's going to score what. I think if we all stand back and waiting for somebody else to do it or for somebody else to achieve something, nothing is going to happen. Thanks. Rick, please. So to answer your question, we need expensive diesel <laughs> because that gets everybody to join hands. I mean, we all want cheap diesel, but we live in a world where it's 25 rand a litre now. And that's why we're here having this discussion. So we forced by necessity to innovate. And I think that's driving us together. So the current economic climate is actually what's needed to join hands. Just staying with you, Rick, we see lots of EVs for passenger vehicles. Eh? Why do you think there's a reluctance to engage at a commercial vehicle, which is the area that you're focusing on? It's got to do with capital cost. So they double the price. Um, people don't like to look at total cost of ownership models. They just want to know what it costs them today. But the savings are there. The savings are massive. So it's becoming something that companies cannot ignore. Um, and it's been, it's a conservative decision making arena. You know, a lot of the guys running fleets have done their stalwarts. They've done things a certain way for a long time. And there's a mindset change that's needed. Yeah, thank you. Eddie, how do you see this transition to green fuels? Uh, what do you see the process that's going to be taking place in order to get us to that zero? I think the idea of crude going so expensive is a big driver, but I also see environmental um, restrictions, carbon taxes and all those type of things. Um, reducing carbon footprint is actually in our favor to actually drive greener fuels. Um, it's it's similar to what happened in the PV industry 20 years ago, very expensive. And I, I'm sure as soon as more of that technologies have been used, get more matured, it's going to be a lot cheaper. Green fuels, low carbon footprint, hydrogen um, fuels, PTX fuels derived out of hydrogen, actually substituting green LPG, green natural gas, all the way to green aviation fuel where we can use the existing technologies and be ha having a zero carbon footprint at the end of the day. That's where we need to drive to. Thanks, Siri. Um, Rick, can I ask you, talk us through the process. What do you foresee that it's going to be like to get commercial fleets and other vehicles into EVs? I think it's going to be a lot like transitioning from steam engines to diesel engines. You know, there was this huge infrastructure laid out 200 years ago in America to produce a rail network out of steam. And that must have taken enormous effort with the limited equipment and machinery they had at the time. So to go from there to internal combustion, to set up the plants and the, the refineries and everything, there was massive investment over 100 years. And that's the level of effort it's going to take. Um, laying out the electrical network and the infrastructure and the decentralized generation and storage it's going to need a herculean effort thank you uh, basil 
how do you see, and, and I just want to give, leave Rick with a thought before I ask you this question, how is Saboa, you're a, an association, how can you drive this? Rick, the Greenpeace tells us that tailpipe emissions only account for 20% 20, 20 of carbon emissions. The rest is in the manufacturing process, uh, the aluminium bodies for vehicles to make them light, lithium iron, and if you have any knowledge about lithium carbon batteries, I'd really appreciate hearing that. You think about that and let Basil talk to us. Thanks, thanks, Eugene. So, yeah, Sabah's role, I think, central to ensuring that there's an alignment, that we we getting focus towards getting towards zero emission. Just to contextualize some of the challenges you may not be aware. Uh, the government issued a public transport tender for the entire bus network in Gauteng for seven years with no indication and no thought of alternative energy vehicles, whether it be now just contextualize that. They would have awarded that tender right about now had we not taken that to court. Not for that reason, for other reasons that it was not deemed to be uh, legitimate and enforceable. But that's how government thinks, okay. They have a social imperative they want to deliver, uh, put transport out, they want to bring taxis into the game, integrate it. So I come back, the policies are there, it's that lack of certainty for policy, but I think Saboa's job would be to harness, and I think collectively, and you would have heard yesterday in the Saboa conference, you can't do it alone. It's partnership, it's partnering, it's bringing the financiers on board. But if, if the industry gets to a point where I can talk to, that is the basic funding model, infrastructure, who owns it, Government makes all the right noises. We want to own the infrastructure. They don't have the skills and competence and money for that. So all the partnershiping will be giving government and the country solutions. Sabah's role would be, in my opinion right now, is just to harness this energy as it grows and we don't leave each other behind in this transition. Thank you, Basil. Rick, your thoughts there on my question? <laughs> so on carbon lithium batteries? Well, what the the Greenpeace say it's in the process of making the EV technology where the biggest carbon emissions are produced. Look, that may be true for the initial use of the vehicle, but if you think about a, a truck for its design lifespan, let's say it's 500,000 kilometers for a medium duty commercial truck, that thing's going to burn 80,000 liters of diesel just on a normal four ton truck. It's over 2 million rand of diesel at so today's price. at today's prices, you know, which could escalate a lot further. So the savings to be had on an electric vehicle really start to pay off after this finance depreciation period. And the battery packs are bulletproof. You know, they're, they're a lot stronger than what people give them credit for. They can last for many thousands of cycles. And even then they can be taken out and used in stationary storage applications for another decade or more. So you get a, a heck of a lot more life out of a battery pack than I think what it's given credit. And that will offset that initial additional cost. Thank you for fielding that one for us. Um, what I must just say, you, as sitting outside RMI and listening to the bus, you know what? The, I was awestruck by the amount of things that are actually taking place. And yet, you know, Joe Public doesn't know about it. Eh? By the way, Rick, we developed an, a white paper on EVs that we've been sharing with customers because the one thing that's become prevalent, many fleets are not ready with policies that would allow the implementation of electric vehicles or gas vehicles for that matter. How would the, the, the user of that be awarded? Would you put base stations at home? These are all of the questions that have arisen. And of course, driving an EV is also a little bit different to driving an ICE engine vehicle. So really, I think there's great opportunities. Uh, we've reached our time limit, but I just want to say to you that in October, which is transport month, we're already planning a colloquium, which is our version of a conference, that EVs and alternative energies are gonna take focus, all right? So please start putting your thinking caps on because we would like that to be, you see, we get an audience of 200 odd in, in, in virtual participation, 
they should be looking forward to what your expertise is going to say. So each of you, give me a final wrap up on what you feel you'd like to share. And even if it's a punt for your product, I really don't mind. Let's start with you, Rick. Okay, great, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to see more corporates willing to test electric vehicles in a commercial setting. You know, install a charger on your wall, run some trials and, and check the data out for yourselves because all the, the vehicles that we've put into a commercial space and run side by side with its diesel counterpart have shown incredible savings, um, incredible total cost of ownership improvements. And I think as the technology gets better, these things are only going to improve further. So we've got a, a, a huge amount of work ahead of us, but it's not an insurmountable task. It's a Versa, A-E-V-E-R-S-A dot com. From my side, um, the conversion of vehicles to gas is a reality. It can be done today. And I want to invite all corporates, fleet owners to actually uh, make contact with the RMI and actually say, how can we do this? What's needed? And it will be on your basis of your existing fleet to actually use it with lower emissions and lower operating cost at the end of the day and a benefit to the environment. Just want to touch on that Joe public issue. You would have noticed yesterday at the Sabawa conference, there were some very strange questions on assumptions. We've heard that electric buses can't climb up hills. <laughs> yeah. And it was fabulous to have the driver who did the test on electric buses yesterday dispel a whole lot of myths. So as we take this journey, the myths and the misinformation needs to be managed. And Sabawa's job, and I'll tie it back to Wayne early on, on your behalf, will hold government accountable in their role for this and in the policy making and the funding. Basil, thank you. And if Derek Mayer is on virtual, he promised us a ride up the hill in Cape Town, an electric bus. Derek, we're going to take you up on that. All right. And then we'll report back on it for everybody. Guys, thank you very much. We're going to give away some prizes so we can ask you to take your seats. But thank you for making the time available. I'm sure everybody appreciated it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So if we can call up the A team from Master Drive just to draw some lucky prizes. Um, the poor guys who didn't pitch, eh? Their cards are still out the front. They get squat. Okay, so it's left to the rest over here. Sorry. Oh, we need, oh, Julian is busy collecting cards for those who didn't put it in. Kathy, you can only put one in. Oh, for three people. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. You know what? We just realized that with the time constraints that we had, we can't afford it. But I'll allow you to ask one question. She's, she's cool. She's from Standard Bank, eh? Okay, you've sold. We love you to bits, Kathy. All right, guys. Listen, I'll organize a personal audience with Kathy at some stage. Rick, she's awesome on your side, but you don't want to get her off sides with you. Eh? Real word of advice. She's like uh, Ivana, but just not in self-defense. No, she mustn't use that word, eh? self-defense. Okay, so we've got all the business cards. While we're getting those business cards, we're going to do something that uh, we specifically left until now, but I need Mashani's attention. 
recall that we said we had somebody who had celebrated 26 years with us. So, Vanessa, please come and get our gift of appreciation and the applause from the audience. I think the next longest serving staff member with me is about 15 years or something. There we are. We'll let you hand it over. over there. Okay. And that's just the one, Vanessa. And here's another one for you. Do you want her to say a speech? <laughs> Let's. Is thank you very much, Eugene. It's been 26 years of learning every single day. Yeah. They, they hate me sometimes, I tell you that. Okay. All right, let's do some draws. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so you read them out and I'll hand them out. So the first one we're going to do is call for. Um... Okay, go for it. Okay, for the first four prizes that uh, it's going to be from compliments from Bridgestone. Let's Are let's use. That I it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Peggy Mars. Peggy Mars. Okay, Peggy, congratulations, well done. Missing a hole already. Yeah. yeah. Gershon Naidu. Hey guys, if you want, if you want to support a good NPO, he's from Meals on Wheels. There's a good guy. Give him a hand. Come here, don't run away. How do you say this? That's from Equestra. Equestra. Debbie. 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 Thank you. Pufu Lam. Pufu Lani. Hey, I must speak Vendor now. Pufu. Pufu Melani. Pefu Mulani. Pefu Mulani. SBS. There we are. Is that State of Bank South Africa? Yes. Hey, hey Rick, you can hit on it all right after this. <laughs> so now we're going to pick out um, three um, cards, and this will be the wine ice buckets that's from Equestra. Jonathan and Parker, easy access. Yeah. Well, this guy wins it. He comes up with the safety awards and he wins. Sipe <laughs> Sitle. Okay. All right, folks, and then we have two from our virtual audience, Monika Engelbrecht and Zaneli Mkuntwana. So they virtual, uh, make contact with us and you'll claim your prizes. Okay, and now what are we doing? Two okay, there's two auto gym corners. Some of the guys have seen our activities up the road here on Terrace 2. So, who would like to come and have some fun with us? Yeah. 
Mahotso Labitsa. Hey. No, have you won already? No, then you can't win again. Okay. I'll tell you who it's not. It's not Kathy Bell. All right. Lorinda from Absa. And here we have Lo Rikat. Come up, Lo. Haven't you found some people win at every event? I've never won anything. Okay, next we have five gift bags from Drive Risk. There's the company over there. You heard about telemetry, etc., cetera, in, in trucks, etc. They're the providers of that. Ish. Richard from ATS. Well, they are partners over here. Susan from Equestra. See where Nkobela from Denon. I, I love it when your customers support your events. Eh? Thank you. How many more there? question don't you guys have business cards <laughs> you know we we run an informal sponsorship where we will print you a hundred business cards kathy bell come up kathy <laughs> no that's for you kathy you deserve it you know what guys she talks a lot she pontificates and she waffles but at the end of it she really does a fantastic job and standard bank should be proud to have her i'll tell your boss that all right okay the next one and the last and final one you guessed it you guessed it did you guess it come on paolo come and get it okay Okay. Okay, so how are we going to award that? Okay. All right. Um, guys, you've seen our performance vehicles outside here. Yeah? Uh, by the way, they use about 36 liters per 100 kilometers. If you, hey, EV conversion for us, all right? Um, we have a high performance driving program that's going to go up now. The value of that is over 6,500 Rand. Uh, just to give you an idea, we replaced a set of tires. It's 31, no, 21,000 Rand. Uh, a tank of fuel is two grand, and that we run out in the morning. So whoever gets this, better be a flippin' petrol head, all right. Okay, so we're gonna do this draw. Now let's make this, uh, come and draw for me, yeah, please. Yeah. You just don't draw your own. It's Paulo Diaz. No, he can't win a prize second time. You can't win a second time. No, you can't, can't win a second Paolo. time, man. Unlucky. Let's do another one. <laughs> There's all these Equestra cards in here. No, no you can't. He's won already. Is he won? What, what's, what's going on here? Okay. This feels like it's rigged, eh? And I'll tell you who would have won it, that would have been low, but he's won a prize already, guys. 
Is this guy allowed to win? Letesha Podgieter. Good work. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. You know what? She's probably going to give it to her boss now. <laughs> As, and then, um, guys, there's the last prize that's available from Ivana. Here's the rules. You write to us, motivating why you should be the winner of that, let's call it self-defense course, for want of a better word. Mail it to our office. It will be either Sam or Nishani. We will then forward it to Ivana with our recommendations. So brown envelopes are not beyond the realms of possibility, all right? No, no, okay, all right. And then we will announce the winner on our newsletter that goes out. So from us, thank you very much for being part of this. It's a special occasion. And please just bear in mind, we're running our Woman With Drive in at the Festival of Motoring in August. You will get the heads up, so it'll be part of that event. Um, by the way, and just so that I've seen so many women with drives, they copy us. So we've trademarked it. So if you want to use the woman with drive, you're welcome to. But we need to get something out of it. So, uh, Kathy, I want Standard Bank to run something like that, all right? Then we can touch on for some money. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Have a good one and drive safe.